Hello and good day to wherever you are listening to us today. It is Friday, 26 March 2021. My name is Christian Lindmeier and I'm welcoming you to today's global COVID-19 press conference. Simultaneous interpretation is provided in the six official UN languages, Arabic, Chinese, French, English, Spanish, and Russian, as well as Portuguese and Hindi. The participants are today present in the room. Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, WHO Director General. Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director for WHO's Health Emergencies Program. Dr. Maria van Kerkhove, Technical Lead on COVID-19. Dr. Mariangela Simao, Assistant Director General for Access to Medicines and Health Products. Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, Chief Scientist. Dr. Bruce Aylward, Special Advisor to the Director General and the Lead on the ACT Accelerator. Let me hand over to the Director General for the opening remarks. Thank you, thank you, Christian. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. At the beginning of the year, I issued a call for countries to work together to ensure vaccination starts in all countries within the first 100 days of the year. 177 countries and economies have started vaccination. In just one month, COVAX has distributed more than 32 million vaccines to 61 countries. COVAX works. There are now just 15 days left before the 100th day of the year, and 36 countries that are still waiting for vaccines so they can start vaccinating health workers and older people. Of those, 16 are scheduled to receive their first dose from COVAX within the next 15 days. That leaves 20 countries who are ready to go and waiting for vaccines. COVAX is ready to deliver, but we can't deliver vaccines we don't have. As you know, bilateral deals, export bans, vaccine nationalism, and vaccine diplomacy have caused distortions in the market with gross inequities in supply and demand. Increased demand for vaccines has led to delays in securing tens of millions of doses that COVAX was counting on. But getting all countries started by day 100 is a solvable problem. COVAX needs 10 million doses immediately as an urgent stopgap measure so these 20 countries can start vaccinating their health workers and older people within the next two weeks. So today I'm asking countries with doses of vaccines that have WHO emergency use listing to donate as many doses as they can to help us meet that target. And I'm asking manufacturers to help ensure these countries can rapidly donate those doses. There are plenty of countries who can afford to donate doses with little disruption to their own vaccination plans. The more countries that donate as soon as possible, the more doses we will have to share with countries who need them desperately. Sharing doses is a tough political choice and governments need the support of their people. I'm encouraged by surveys in high-income countries showing widespread support for vaccine equity. 10 million doses is not much, and it's not nearly enough, but it is a start. We will need hundreds of millions more doses in the coming months. There are many countries who invested in COVAX in good faith, but have been left frustrated because of the bilateral deals that have left COVAX short. WHO and our partners are continuing to work around the clock 
to find ways to increase production and secure doses. There are four more vaccines at different stages in the process of being assessed for WHO emergency use listing. And we hope to approve at least one of them by the end of April. WHO is also concerned about the potential for criminal groups to exploit the huge global unmet demand for vaccines. A number of ministries of health, national regulatory authorities, and public procurement organizations have received suspicious offers to supply COVID-19 vaccines. We're also aware of vaccines being diverted and reintroduced into the supply chain with no guarantee that cold chain has been maintained. Some falsified products are also being sold as vaccines on the internet, especially on the dark web. And we are aware of other reports of corruption and reuse of empty vaccine vials. We urge the secure disposal or destruction of used and empty vaccine vials to prevent them from being reused by criminal groups. And we urge all people not to buy vaccines outside government-run vaccination programs. Any vaccine bought outside these programs may be substandard or falsified with the potential to cause serious harm. It's important to remember that any harm caused by a falsified product does not reflect a safety failure of the genuine vaccine. WHO regularly issues global medical product alerts on substandard and falsified products, and we will do so when and if necessary for COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics. We urge all countries and individuals to pay careful attention to this issue. Any suspicious sale of vaccines should be reported to national authorities who will report it to WHO. Information flow is essential to map, to map global threats and protect confidence in vaccines. Finally, I would like to wish Hag, Pesach, Semeach to everyone celebrating the first night of the Passover holiday tomorrow. Christian, back to you. Thank you very much, Director General. With this, we open the rounds of questions. Um, to get into the queue to ask questions, you need to raise your hand using the raise your hand icon and then do not forget to unmute yourself when it's time. We'll start with Antonio Broto from EFE. Antonio, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Christian. Um, so I want to ask about the situation in Chile. Uh, Chile is one of the countries uh, with higher percentage of uh, population vaccinated, but at the same time is one of the countries with a uh, higher rise of new infections uh, in the region in Latin America. So uh, why do you think this is happening? And is this a worrying uh, trend for WHO? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antonio. I'll hand over to Maria van Kerkhove, please. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So the, the question is specific to Chile, and indeed uh, Chile has seen an increase in cases in the last uh, several weeks. It's a similar trend that we've seen across the Americas, and particularly in Brazil and also in the Southern Cone. Um, but that is actually reflected in a number of countries across the world. Um, and if we look back at the last seven days alone, across the world we've seen a 15 percent increase in cases and we now see an increase in cases in the last week in all six WHO regions. So this is a worrying trend that we're seeing across a number of countries. Um, there's a number of factors that could be associated with this. I don't have the specifics for Chile in front of me, um, but 
across the world, we are seeing that there are some changes that are happening um, that increase transmission. And a lot of this has to do with, with the rollout of vaccines and vaccinations, which is uneven and inequitable, as you've heard us say many, many times. Um, there are some individuals that are not adhering to the measures that are in place, the physical distancing, the hand hygiene, the um, washing of your hand, cleaning of your hands, the respiratory etiquette, avoiding crowded spaces, opening the windows. All of that needs to take place in addition to the vaccines being rolled out um, because it does take time to reach, though vaccination takes time to reach those who are most in need. Um, and it will take time to reach enough of the population to have an impact not only on reducing severe disease and death, but also reducing transmission. So there are a number of factors, I think, that are associated with increases in, in transmission, even though we're seeing vaccination rolled out. That doesn't really make sense intuitively. You would expect that as vaccination is underway, that transmission is going down. But in fact, vaccination is one tool that we have to reduce the spread. We cannot rely on vaccination alone. We have to ensure that everybody adheres to the measures that are in place that keep themselves safe and keep their loved ones safe. So please continue to do it all across the board. And we need governments to support individuals um, to be able to stay at home if they're unwell, to be in isolation, to be in supported quarantine. This needs to still be part of our control measures for, for reducing transmission around the world. Um. If I could supplement, I believe uh, the Health Ministry uh, made this uh, decision based on the epidemiology in the, the first few weeks of March um, and uh, have uh, increased the measures in, as a means of protecting uh, the health system. Uh, there are about just over 3,000 critical care beds in, in, in Chile uh, and only uh, 188 of those were available on the 18th of March. So the, the rise in infections was really uh, threatening to overwhelm the basic the capacity to provide uh, clinical care. So Chile surpassed 7,000 daily cases on the 23rd uh, of 21st of March, sorry, and that, uh, representing a sharp increase. And the last time I think cases were this high in Chile was May and June of last year. So I think the Ministry have recognised epidemiologically the situation is difficult. The health system is coming under pressure and I believe they've taken rational measures to try and reduce transmission. And as Maria said, back, the benefit of vaccines has not probably kicked in yet in terms of having enough people vaccinated to protect uh, the maximum number of people from severe disease and hospitalisation. And I think again, it emphasises the fact that without all vulnerable people being vaccinated in all countries, many countries will face the similar problem as they get inevitable rises in cases. That uh, rise in cases will be paid for in severe cases and deaths and speaks exactly to what the Director General has been speaking about, making sure that those most vulnerable and most likely to suffer and those most likely to die in every country in the world have adequate protection from vaccination. Uh, but the Chilean government, I think, have taken rad uh, um, appropriate measures. They've also taken measures with regards to travel into the country. They have um, um, detected variants of concern within the country as well. So they're also trying to ensure that those variants don't take over uh, the epidemiology within, within Chile. But I think a rational response on behalf of the Chilean government in the face of rising numbers and increased strain on the health system. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan and uh, Dr. Aylward, please. Thanks, uh, Christian. Antonio, thanks for the question because it's so important, right? Any increase in cases is a worrying trend. Let's be super clear. There's no such thing as an unworrying increase in cases with this disease, a serious disease. Um, and I think what we're also, it highlights again, as you said, that many countries are rolling out vaccines now. The obvious thing is Mike and Maria emphasized is these vaccines are great vaccines. They work really well, but we do not have sufficient vaccines and at scale to be able to change the course of the uh, epidemic right now. We've got so many other measures we have to be using at the same time and we have to be using our vaccines smart. We've got to be using them to protect those healthcare workers who've got to deal with this oscillating disease and surges of cases and to protect 
like the older people so that they don't suffer the severe disease and possibly death as a result. And it highlights the appeal that the Director General made at the beginning of, uh, of, of this press conference that not all countries can do what Chile can do and try and roll out the vaccines to protect people in the face of surging disease because they don't have access to the doses. Um, and what we need to do is get more doses of vaccine into the COVAX facility so that we can ensure all countries can protect their healthcare workers because this disease will continue to surge as we're seeing in places like Chile, even though we uh, are rolling out the vaccines right now. And at the same time, we've got to do everything. It's difficult. I won't repeat what Michael, uh, Mike Rother and uh, Maria said, but we've got to maintain the other measures until we have really high vaccine coverage and we're some ways away from that yet. Thank you, Dr. Elwood, and I believe Dr. O'Brien, who's also in the room, will add. I just wanted to uh, add a couple of points to um, what's already been uh, uh, mentioned, and that is that um, I think, as everybody knows, the evidence on the vaccines is um, really clear about the prevention of disease, certainly the prevention of severe disease and death for these vaccines. Um, but the part of the evidence that is still rolling in is the degree to which they also protect against getting infected. And clearly, to get disease, you have to get infected. But um, just because you get infected doesn't mean that you get disease. But it certainly can mean that you can transmit to somebody else. So I think the other point is that we're emphasizing, especially as vaccines are rolling out, and there are many people in the community who are not vaccinated and not protected against disease, um, that continuation of the measures to avoid transmission um, even if you're not symptomatic, is so incredibly important as we're rolling out vaccines and that increase in immunity in the population is continuing. Um, we also have the variants of concern, and we don't have um, information that is firm and clear about the degree to which each of these vaccines against each of the variants of concern um, may have some reduction um, or change in the ability that they have to protect against infection and to protect against disease. So we're in a, just a really dynamic environment right now um, as these incredible tools that are the vaccines are rolling out. And so this is, this is the time when we should really do everything possible to keep transmission low because it is that low transmission that will also impede and avoid um, the emergence of other variants. Um, thank you. Thank you all um, for the answers. Now we move to the next on my list, and we have a long list already. Um, Catherine Fiancombo Congo from France 24. Uh, Catherine, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Christian. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, my question um, is related to vaccination. As we know, vaccination is one of the, the tools we have uh, that we can rely on. And certain countries have decided to inoculate only one dose to persons uh, who already got COVID-19. So my question is, number one, is it safe? Um, is it efficient against the new variants? And what is the safest way to identify asymptomatic people? Because certain people don't know if they already got COVID or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. O'Brien, please. Thanks for the question. Um, again, as uh, we've now um, uh, the strategic advisory group of experts, the, the expert committee that um, provides uh, recommendations to WHO for our policies on vaccines. Um, we've looked at a number of the vaccines um, uh, for specific recommendations. There's one that is um, specifically uh, tested and designed for as a one-dose regimen, and that's the Janssen product. The other products are two-dose regimens, and we are fully aware that there are um, there is evidence around the uh, magnitude of the immune response after a single dose of those two dose um, regimens. And there is some evidence around the amount of protection against disease after receiving a single dose. But what we certainly don't have is evidence of uh, not giving the second dose for those two dose regimens. We would not know how long the protection from a single dose um, lasts. Um, nor is it likely to be the maximum benefit that the vaccines can offer. So we recommend that for the vaccines that have a two-dose regimen, that they are given in a two-dose regimen. For those people who've had disease before, 
Um, again, we are aware of the evidence that there is a strong immune response after a single dose, but we're just in, a, in a, an environment right now where we don't have sufficient evidence to change the recommendation. That being said, um, for those, uh, we, we certainly are not recommending that people um, test individuals before giving vaccine to determine whether or not they have had COVID before. Um, if, it's, if somebody has uh, known that they've had COVID disease, they could make an individual decision to delay the receipt of that vaccine if it's in short supply in their community so that somebody else could go first. Um, but we really just don't have enough information on the variants um, to understand whether that's an optimum strategy or not. We do recognize that countries um, are making the best decisions they can uh, on, in their own policies about the optimum way to use the vaccines that are available to them. Um, and there is a range of decisions that could be made about this even while um, the, the evidence is, is rolling out. So uh, we're very much encouraging that for any um, adjustments to the schedule that countries are um, recommending that they uh, study those so that we actually have evidence that could could help additional countries make decisions about the optimum use of the vaccines. And the most important thing at this point um, is to get as much vaccine as we can available um, to the highest risk people um, so that they can be protected against disease and eventually um, a, a sufficient uh, immunity in the population that we hope um, and expect will really reduce transmission from that broad-based immunity, but we're, we're pretty far distance from that. And Dr. Swaminathan to add, please. Just to add to what um, Kate was saying, I think there's, uh, there is a specific vaccine, which is the AstraZeneca vaccine, which, for which there is data for the um, gap between the two doses between being four weeks or uh, 12 weeks and beyond. And some countries, uh, so there was data from the clinical trials um, which suggested that the longer the interval, at least up to 12 weeks, the better the immune response and the better the uh, efficacy of the vaccine. So there's also modeling done to show that if you have a limited number of vaccine doses and you want to protect the population, um, particularly the high-risk groups, the, the older groups, and so on. So countries like the UK, for example, have taken the approach of vaccinating more people with available vaccines and then giving the second dose at a time around 12 weeks. Um, and the, the SAGE that uh, Dr. O'Brien mentioned, the advisory group um, that advises WHO, recommended a, a gap of 8 to 12 weeks between the first and the second dose for the AstraZeneca vaccine. And this was based on an analysis of the data, both the immunogenicity data in the lab as well as the efficacy data. And we're getting more data now from the actual rollout of vaccines in, in countries which have opted to use this delayed approach, showing that the, the first dose is providing protection, significant protection against hospitalization and severe disease. So it seems to be a good strategy to protect more people more quickly. But of course, the second dose must be given. And we're also now... Uh, encouraged that there are trials going on looking at a um, combination of uh, vaccines, so a first dose with one and a second dose with another one, and to see if that, in fact, provides better protection. And we'll also have uh, more studies hopefully coming through with more single-dose vaccines as well as with uh, vaccines that can be given, for example, by nasal spray, which actually might uh, create more immunity in the respiratory tract. So it's really uh, wonderful to see so much research going on on existing vaccines as well as new vaccines, and we look forward to more uh, data. The other question you asked was about asymptomatic infection, and as you know, it's very difficult um, and on a routine basis, but what the clinical trials did was one of two things. Either they used a nasal swab in the participants every week to see if they were getting infected, even without symptoms, or they used the antibody test, so they took blood at regular intervals to measure the antibodies. And so at the end of the trial, we will be able to see how well these vaccines protected against the asymptomatic infection as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for these explanations. We'll move on to Simon Atiba from Today News Africa. Simon, please unmute yourself. Thank you for taking my question. 
This is Simon Ateba with Today News Africa in Washington, D.C. President Biden said days ago the U.S. has millions of doses of AstraZeneca vaccine that have not been used. Is the WHO in talks with President Biden to send those vaccines to COVAX? And talking about COVAX, the WHO said recently the COVAX facility was still in need of over $20 billion dollars to provide enough vaccination, enough vaccination, vaccination to most people in the world and begin to crush the coronavirus. How much money is still needed now? I know President Biden has already pledged $4 billion to WHO and COVAX, but clearly the money is not enough and the U.S. has more than enough money to provide the $20 billion left if the WHO in talk with President Biden for additional financial contribution? And has the WHO received the first pledge from President Biden? And how significant has that contribution been so far? Thank you. Simon, thank you very much. Uh, we have a rule of one question only. These were about 10, I lost counting. But uh, let me hand over to Dr. Aylward, please. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much, Simon. They were all good questions. So, so for, first and foremost, uh, on the issue of donations, indeed, and uh, what we refer to as dose sharing, indeed, we're in discussions with all countries that have access to substantial uh, doses of, of WHO emergency use listed vaccines for sharing of doses and donations of doses to the COVAX facility so that we can ensure all countries can get started in all countries can sustain vaccination, especially of healthcare workers and especially of their older populations. And so we have been in discussion since uh, December. You, if you go back and have a look, you'll see that in December we established the uh, dose sharing principles for working with COVAX to ensure that um, high quality doses of vaccines can get out to all countries equitably through the COVAX facility. And since that time, uh, we've been in discussion with many countries, uh, the US, the EC, Canada, uh, the UK, uh, and others, uh, Australia, New Zealand, about sharing of doses to uh, through the COVAX facility. Um, a lot of positive interest uh, across countries to, to do that, um, balancing, of course, also their own uh, domestic needs. But as you heard from uh, the Director General in his opening comments, um, we are at a particularly crucial point right now in the rollout of doses uh, uh, globally and uh, are, are, are encouraging any country that can help uh, to do so. Um, we're encouraging, though, and I want to highlight this, not just, the, uh, not just the countries that have access to doses today or have contracts with the suppliers, but we're also calling on the suppliers to help as well. Because as many of you will understand, there's contracts established with countries for their doses, um, but in those countries may say, okay, we want to donate those doses to COVAX, but we need the help of the suppliers as well to take those contracts, adapt those contracts with Gavi and with COVAX and with the countries involved very, very rapidly, not over weeks and months, but over days and hours to be able to ensure doses can be redirected to help um, in places that really need them and need them uh, urgently to begin the rollout, uh, the equitable rollout. So it's not just countries, Simon. We're also calling on the uh, companies as well to uh, work with us on this as rapidly as possible. And in terms of, uh, of the financing, we do need over $20 billion, $22 billion, but that's for the entire Act A agenda or the Act Accelerator agenda to ensure the equitable distribution of vaccines, oxygen, dexamethasone, PPE, and diagnostics. As the Director General, Mike, and Maria reaffirm all the time, countries need that whole package to control the disease protect their health systems, health workers, and populations, and get their economies going again. So that's for that whole package. Within the ACT Accelerator, one of the best financed uh, aspects are the, uh, the, uh, the, is the COVAX facility, rather. But we still do have an urgent $2.3 billion gap in the uh, needs to be able to procure and close some of the deals that we have to be able to uh, uh, um, um, secure as much vaccine as is available this year for low and low middle income countries in particular. Thank you very much, Dr. Elwood. With this, we move to the next on my list, and list, and that's Christiane Ulrich from DPR. Christiane, please unmute yourself. 
Thank you for taking my question. Um, Dr. Tedros, we, we heard yesterday that the COVAX crisis is in large part due to Indian export restrictions. Uh, 90 out of the 237 million doses that were to be delivered will not come in time in March and April. So the picture is a bit different. It's not the rich countries that have secured uh, billion, uh, millions of doses that are holding them back. It seems to be a developing country that is the main problem. Are you talking to the Prime Minister of India to uh, change uh, his attitude, or do, do you think that India, as a developing country, uh, sh should also look after their own population first? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, of, uh, first of all, I would actually like to thank India for its uh, generosity. Uh, as you know, India has shared lots of vaccines globally. If you would, uh, you know, just call one country who has contributed more than uh, any country on, on earth in terms of sharing vaccines, it would be India. So I'd like to thank the Prime Minister and, you know, his government uh, for, for this support. Uh, what's happening now is it's not export ban from uh, India, as far as we know. Uh, but as you may know, the number of cases in India, in India is on the increase. Uh, so they need more vaccines also to use locally in order to fight the increasing number of uh, cases. Uh, so that's understandable. But at the same time, we're already in discussion to keep a balance uh, so that they can use locally, but at the same time continue to provide other countries uh, vaccines from the Serum Institute of uh, India. Uh, so um, uh, we hope that, um, uh, you know, uh, the two could be addressed and we have a balanced uh, solution. Uh, but I would like to use this opportunity actually to thank India. And I know they will continue to collaborate with, with uh, COVAX uh, and with WHO. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director General and Dr. Elwood, please. Uh, the Director General has spoken. I think we're good. Thank you. And with this, we move to the next question, and that's Nina Larsen from AFP. Nina, please unmute yourself. Yes, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, I was going to ask, uh, U.S. President Biden uh, said yesterday that he now aims to ensure that 200 million doses of vaccine will be given to Americans within his first 100 days in office. Um, how concerned are you that this might send the wrong message uh, as it seems to run counter to your call for vaccine solidarity among countries? And if I could just ask, sorry, one housekeeping question, if you have any update on when the Wuhan mission report will be uh, published, that would be helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nina. Let me look around on the first question. Pardon me? No, I wanted to look for the first question about the vaccines. Dr. Aylward, please. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Nina, for the question. You know, every country is trying to do what, and every political leader, what it thinks is the best possible thing for for its people. And uh, we, we know that, we recognize that. But, um, of course, we are concerned that not all countries have access to vaccines yet, and we call on all countries to try and help solve that problem uh, by ensuring that we've got access to vaccines through the COVAX facility and that 
all countries continue to prioritize their health care workers as the first line to protect our uh, vital infrastructure and the people who have got such a high risk of exposure to this disease as they try and help people and save lives. And then, of course, the older uh, people, people with comorbidities. And depending on the country, of course, those can be substantial populations. But what we're calling for is to ensure that all countries roll the vaccines out in that order. And fortunately, what we're seeing in most places is exactly that attention being given to their health care workers first, then their older populations, and people with comorbid uh, uh, conditions, as we've talked about before. Um, we are concerned that some countries don't have access yet to vaccines to be able to do that. But we are, you know, we are, we are encouraged that uh, every country is saying the right thing. They're trying to do the right thing, and they're trying to help uh, ensure that we have the doses we need to be able to do it. So uh, we continue to look for, as the Director General said in his opening comments, um, support in the near term, in the short term, to help through this urgent period that we have over the next couple of weeks to try and get all countries started, and then coming in behind that with the uh, doses to be able to get coverage up. Um, there's lots of countries, as everyone knows, and you've asked us about it many times, that have uh, contracted or secured or optioned um, a large number of doses that go beyond the needs for their own countries. And what we're hoping as uh countries now get comfortable with the rollout of their products, that they'll be able to start uh, discussing, sharing uh, um, large, uh, larger numbers of doses through COVAX to be able to vaccinate populations everywhere. Thank you very much, Dr. Elwin. And I believe for the second part, we have Dr. Peter ben Embrek online. He's WHO expert on food safety and zoonosis and the international lead of the WHO convened global study of the origins of SARS-CoV-2. Peter, please. Thank you, Christian, and thank you for the question. Um, you probably heard me say in the past uh, that we were very close to uh, to finalizing the report, and uh, uh, I'm the first one to uh, regret that uh, it's not yet out. But it's, uh, it, the draft is now finalized. We have a joint report. Uh, we are now at the a point where we are doing uh, a, a cleaning of the document, um, just to make sure that uh, we don't have uh, a small errors in the text and that all the experts are um, okay with the content as it is uh, and we also have to that that, ha that happening on both languages chinese and english uh, and we are as i said earlier i think uh, uh, working uh, over 10 different time zones um, uh, and uh, with two different languages so it's a very slow and complicated process to get it there uh, you can imagine that in the report of 400 pages we have hundreds and hundreds of names of locations of uh, 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 things, small details that need to be um, carefully translated, uh, etc. So it's um, it, it, it's a, in a way painful a process to to get to the finishing line. But uh, the content is uh, is now uh, complete, complete, and uh, frankly speaking, I expect that in the next uh, uh, few days uh, that whole process will be uh, completed and uh, we'll be able to uh, release it. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter von uh, Benemberg and uh, Dr. Mike Ryan, please. And, and just a reminder that uh, um, we, we had a, a number of missions uh, uh, to, to work in, in, in China, but the, these specific uh, set of activities have been uh, activities requested under the <clears throat> resolution of the, the World Health Assembly last May, and uh, the Director General uh, was asked to to uh, set up a series of uh, collaborative and scientific missions to understand better the origins of the virus. This mission has been one very important piece uh, of that process. Uh, but uh, with respect to our member states, the, the report will be shared as a, as a, as a mission report to the member states uh, for, for their consideration and, and discussion. And, and the, 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 the report will obviously then be, be released publicly subsequently or during that process. But uh, we want to show due respect for, for our member states and share that report with them first, as they have been the ones who've worked very closely with the Director General to ensure that this work has been completed. Thank you very much for these clarifications. And looking at the many lists, the, the long list of questions, may I ask those who wanted to ask a similar question 
to lower their hand so we can see what other topics are on for today. With this, I move to uh, Laurent Sierro from the Swiss News Agency. Laurent, please unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, Christian, to, for taking my question. Um, the former Brazilian President Lula uh, this morning said that uh, the, the current president's behavior was the biggest genocide in the, in the country's history. And then yesterday, the French President Macron said that there was a new kind of world war around vaccine with Russia and, and China. And, and there, there are also the increasing tensions between UK and and the EU around vaccines. So it seems that we reached a new stage in that rhetoric this week. Uh, what kind of effects do you see for the, the way the pandemic should be handled in the next weeks and months? And would you go as far as, as uh, former President Lula and say that some leaders have deliberately chosen not to, to assist uh, their people? Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurent. Let me look around. Uh, talk. Mike Ryan, maybe? Um, um, I think uh, all countries have faced you know, major uh, challenges in, in this, and, and certainly uh, Bruce and others can speak to the, the issues around um, <clears throat> vaccine nationalism and, and, and that. But, but there, we have to also see that uh, political leaders are in difficult positions regarding what they, the demands of, of populations. It's very difficult. But you also have to take that global perspective. Um, and uh, from WHO's perspective, we look at all of the, the states in the world and all of the peoples of the world. Um, and if WHO came up with a policy where we vaccinate in one country and finish there before we'd vaccinate in those, it would be very similar if a country decided to vaccinate in one state and completely finish there before starting in, in another uh, subunit of the nation. We, we see the world in a global perspective. We see all humanity as equal, all human beings born as having equal right uh, to health and to the preservation of their health. So some of this tension comes really from the perspectives of which people sit, where they sit in the argument and where they're having the argument for, from and, 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 and who is influencing and shouting at them. So it's a very complex environment and I think it can be oversimplified uh, and made too simplistic. There are so many complex factors driving this and Bruce may speak to that. But I, I, I don't believe it's true uh, that uh, in the vast overwhelming majority of cases, regardless of ideologic perspective, most leaders are trying to do their best for their people. Uh, no more than ourselves, they don't always do it perfectly. Uh, that's part of the process. Uh, of, uh, of the imperfections that we see in every aspect of human endeavour. But I think it goes way too far to say that, uh, that, uh, that leaders in general uh, are behaving in a way that is designed against their own people. That doesn't mean that leaders at all levels do not make mistakes. Bruce. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mike, and, and thanks for the question, Laurent. It, it's an important one um, because, frankly, we, we are in a war, um, and, and leaders are right. We, we are in a war, and it's a war against a virus and not against each other. And one of the things that's been extraordinary in this crisis is just how many world leaders you have an opportunity to interact with uh, through the Director General and others. And um, they have common purpose in this, and that common purpose is to beat this virus. There's absolutely no question about that. Yes, there are a lot of tensions, there are a lot of emotions. Um, you know, there's a bit of friendly fire uh, perhaps now and again, uh, but that's the nature of a battle like this. It's been going on for over a year. People are tired, people are exhausted, and there's incredible demands on everybody, including uh, political leaders everywhere as they try to navigate the way out of this. Um, but we have a common purpose, a common destiny in this. It's very, very clear as well. And every leader that we deal with, um, they recognize and they reiterate again and again that we can only get out of this together. Um, it's the right thing to do to make sure everyone has access to these rare or scarce for the moment resources, vaccines in particular. Um, we also have an economic reason to get the world's economy going. And we also have a health security reason because of variants. Everyone is acutely aware of that and everybody is working to find a common way forward. So it is going to be a uh, tough, uh, it's been a tough couple of 
of weeks. It will be a tough few months as we go forward. There's incredible demands on everyone, but uh, everyone is working to common purpose and, and recognizes that. I think one of the most encouraging things, Mike, we've been at this for 30 years, these kind of these people are committed to work together uh, uh, on these things. Um, so uh, importantly, and it goes back to some of the questions, you know, that were asked earlier, what we're trying to ensure is that as countries now reach more and more of their populations, they look at the vaccines that they have access to, they look at the contracts that they have, and they say, you know what, we can share some of this now at this point. Before we go into our younger populations, et cetera, with vaccines, we can share them. And again, that's what, uh, it's in everyone's common interest to do that. And uh, certainly all the leaders we've talked to are, uh, feel that that's the right thing to do. The challenge, of course, is uh, realizing that as soon as we can. And uh, Dr. Meran, a, a very quick complimentary comment, because I, I think we learned a lot in this one year. You know, in one year and in, in, uh, two months, probably. Uh, because we know now what works in, that we didn't know last year in March. You know, so the, the, the fact that we need to think about the public policies being based on evidence, it's a different scenario from one year ago. You know, now the world's better equipped to, f to deal with the, the, the resurgence of cases in many places. We learned with medicines will help in which we want. We, we'll lear we learned what, what are the guidelines that should be in place in terms to, to, to help uh, and save lives when in the case of management of severe cases. So I think that uh, that's another thing that we need to think when you're looking in retrospect. It's very easy to point fingers and see what went wrong. We need to look ahead and look at what the science has, to, has given us and make sure that the policies that are put in place at country level are evidence-based. I think that's quite good. Thank you very much, Dr. Simao. With this, we move to the next question. That's Sophie Mokwena from SABC South Africa. Sophie, please unmute yourself. Thank you, sir. Um, I just want to ask a question around the coming holiday. Uh, we've had reports that some countries are already indicating that they are seeing the signs of uh, uh, third wave. Has the WHO perhaps uh, observed that or have they picked up the signs of third wave? And uh, what must countries do during this time? Thanks, Sophie. I, I think you were asking about if we were seeing signs of a third wave. Um, we are seeing signs of increasing transmission around the world, um, and, and there's a number of reasons. There's a number of factors that are associated with this. Um, we are not out of this pandemic. Um, the pandemic is not over. I know we are over it, but it is not over us. Um, we are still in the acute phase of this pandemic, where in many parts of the world, the virus is still in control of our lives. We are not in control of the virus. That is not true all over the world. Some countries have actually shown that we can control COVID with the tools at hand, with the addition of vaccination. But in fact, some countries have actually controlled COVID without vaccination yet. Um, and I think uh, it's important to remind everyone that we know a lot about this virus. We know about how it spreads. And in, in it really is a factor of our mixing patterns. When we see people mixing and increasing the number of, of contacts that they have, if people are spending a, a long amount of time together, if they're, if they're mixing with more individuals, more families, um, the virus will take an opportunity to spread. So we have seen uh, with some holidays, we certainly saw this over December, January holidays, where people had increased the amount of mixing that they had with other families. We saw transmission increase dramatically in a number of countries. We now have virus variants, at least three variants of concern that WHO is tracking, the B117 that was first identified in the United Kingdom, the B1351 that was first identified in South Africa, and the P1 variant that is circulating in Brazil that was first identified um, in a traveler in Japan. Um, there are more variants of interest that are also being tracked. Um, the variants of concern are more transmissible, and if you have a more transmissible virus, it means it can spread more easily. Um, if we increase our mixing patterns, if we have virus variants, transmission will increase. We're now into the fifth week. 
where globally we have seen an increase in transmission around the world. I mentioned in my earlier answer, now all WHO regions are seeing an increase in transmission compared to the last week. Um, this is important because 15 months in, um, people want this to be over, but we still have to put in the work. All of us have a role to play here in reducing transmission, and this includes during holidays. Um, all of us want to spend time with our families and, and travel around, and, um, and there are safe ways to, to be able to start to do this, but we need to think about what each of us are doing every day, what we need to be doing versus what we really want to do. We will get there. We will get to a point where this pandemic will be over. I promise we will get there, but we need to put in the work now to drive transmission down especially as we are rolling out vaccines and vaccinations around the world. So think about uh, what you are able to do during this holiday period. Think about there are many holidays that are coming up. Um, you can celebrate a lot of these virtually. Um, and in some situations, you can meet and you can meet outdoors instead of indoors. Um, and if, they, if you do need to meet with others, limit the time that you are together. Do this outdoors as opposed to indoors. Make sure you keep your physical distancing. You wear your masks. All of these measures still hold true. This is the true if you're celebrating Passover or Easter or your child's birthday party. Um, each of these events has the potential to either facilitate transmission or not. So all of us have this role to play in the decisions that we make to make sure that we don't spread the virus, that we don't get infected at first, but if we get infected, that we isolate, we get, it, get a hold of our contacts so they could be quarantined, and we stop transmission, we break the chains of transmission. We can do this, we need to continue to do this. Um, especially through these holidays uh, in the next few months. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. We move on to Kai Kupferschmidt from Science. Kai, please unmute yourself. Thanks, Christian. Um, I wanted to ask a kind of complicated question, but it's about the possible side effects that we have been seeing in Europe with the AstraZeneca vaccine. So it is becoming clearer that there are quite a few cases of this rare constellation of thrombocytopenia together with thrombosis in kind of unusual places. And some of the societies for uh, thrombosis and hematology are starting to, to tell people to look out for certain symptoms. There's an idea that the mechanism might be related to HIT. And I wanted to know, since this vaccine is so crucial for COVAX, and we're talking about many young populations as well in countries that might not have the best surveillance system in place or treatment options for something like this. What's the current status of WHO on these concerns? Are you sharing anything with the countries in terms of what to look out for? Thank you very much, Kai. Let me start with Dr. Marianne Chirang Simao. Let me start and then colleagues can complement. Thank you, Kai. This was actually last week it was very hot on the on the news and, and, and there was a there were a lot of follow ups on, on on this issue. You know that WHO has a global advisory committee on safety, vaccine safety that meets regularly and that has reviewed the the documentation available from all regions in the world, you know, because these vaccines the AstraZeneca vaccines are not only being used in Europe, they are being used in different regions. And also, we WHO worked with, together with the, the, the European Medicines Agency and participating in the discussions that where the data from Europe were very uh, were assessed in a lot of detail. Right. So uh, the position stands that the, the benefits out, outweigh the risks. The, the, we have not received uh, uh, any communication so far. We are following very closely with all WHO regions. There is a network on safety monitoring post-market introduction with uh, different regulatory authorities from the different regions of the world. We did not observe an, uh, uh, um, an increased number of the, the, the blood uh, clot disorders in the general population. The, the rates were below the background uh, rates. And we are, um, the very rare uh, potential, the, it's been investigated, a potential link to a very rare side events. We're calling the very rare, which are, you know, would happen one in a million 
still being investigated by WHO and also by the, the European Magistrates and Agencies and other uh, uh, regulatory uh, agencies in different countries. Uh, that would include the, 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 the coagulation, uh, intravascular coagulation disorder and, and cerebral venous thrombosis. But so far, we, this is under investigation, but still, like we're saying, this is a very important vaccine. The, our, um, and Kate can speak a little bit about it because our special, uh, the advisory group on, on vaccines also has has assessed the, the safety data. So the, so far, there's no news on this. People should continue to, to vaccinate because the, the potential risk with not vaccinating people at higher risk of, in, of death is much, much greater than any potential uh, side effect that may come up. But we are keeping a track of all vaccines, not only AstraZeneca vaccines. We, we keep a surveillance on all vaccines that are in the market right now. Over. And Dr. Cato Prime, please. Thank you for this. Uh, I'd like to um, just give a couple more framing uh, sort of comments around this. Um, the first is that, uh, as um, Dr. Simao uh, emphasized, the, the observation of these events are very, very rare events. They've uh, been observed uh, in the context of tens of millions of doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine having been administered, and a, a, a small number of these cases, as, as uh, serious and important as they are, we really need to emphasize and keep in context um, the rare nature of the events. The second is that, um, as, she, as she described, uh, we always are looking at the ratio of the benefit and the risk. Um, and just as an example, if you take the UK as an example of, of a, a country that's had 1,800 COVID deaths for every million people in the UK, 40 million traffic deaths, 40 traffic deaths per million people, and um, zero COVID vaccine-related deaths for every million doses that are given. Um, now, the information continues to roll out, and, and what is still under assessment is whether any of these rare events are directly related to the vaccine itself, and even if they are, uh, they are extremely rare events. We also have vaccines that um, we, are, we know uh, cause um, um, other uh, unintended side effects. And I'll, I'll just give an example of the rotavirus vaccine, which is associated with, again, rare events of intussusception. But when we look at the benefit of the vaccine to prevent a disease that is very important and a cause of death in young children, that benefit far outweighs um, the potential low risk, extremely low risk, of um, an unintended side effect. So it really is this balance of the benefit and the risk that we're seeing, and this very scrupulous attention to trying to quantify if there is a rare event, what is the nature of the rare event, um, what is it uh, related to, and how could, um, could we be cautious around that, and especially um, if uh, identify people who might need medical care should they have this very rare event. And, and then the point about the AstraZeneca vaccine and the um, critical importance of this vaccine for protection of people around the world. Um, again, uh, millions of doses um, that are uh, already being given, preventing uh, deaths and serious disease um, among elderly people, healthcare workers, um, people of, of middle age as well as it's rolling out in different countries. Um, and the uh, importance of this vaccine to the global supply of COVID vaccines. So we do have to always look at that ratio of benefit and risk and then do anything that can be done um, to minimize the risk if, if it is recognized. Um, and again, it's still under an evaluation to determine whether or not it's directly related to the, the vaccine itself. Thank you very much for this very important clarification again. And with this, we reached the end of our briefing. 
I thank you all very much. We have a, I have still have a very long list of questions attending today, but uh, I hope we see you again next week. Um, before I hand over for the final words to Dr. Tedros, I'll be, I'm reminding you that we send out the Dr. Tedros remarks right after the press conference and the full transcript will be posted on the website tomorrow morning. For any follow-up questions, please send an email to mediainquiries at who.int. Dr. Tedros, please. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Christian. And uh, I would like to repeat uh, wishing Chag Pesach Semeach. And with that, thank you so much for joining us uh, today and look forward to seeing you next week and bon weekend. <laughs>